was chatting with a web developer friend the other day. He asked the question, what is assembly language? And this took me back a little bit. I, I thought, you know, you're a programmer, surely you know what assembly language is. But then it occurred to me, actually, there's probably many programming professions where people will never have any exposure or, or reason to use assembly language, such as, yes, web development, database backends, user interface designers, script writers. And so I thought it might be worth to put together a little video on what is assembly language. When I was working in academia, I used to work in a laboratory that designed processes, right through from the conceptual stage to actually fabricating them on silicon. When you develop your own processes, you also need to create your own framework and tools. So we had to design an assembly language, we had to design an instruction set, and then build compilers and debugging tools. Now the thing with assembly languages, there are many, many different flavours. In fact, you could argue that for every different type of processor architecture out there, there is a unique assembly language for it. I'm not going to go into the specifics for this video today. This is really a, where does assembly language fit in the scheme of programming? To understand the role of assembly language, we're going to need to look at the fundamentals of computer architecture. We're going to look at CPUs and memory and how they talk to each other. But before we get started, at the end of this video, there's a couple of my thoughts about the recent events that have happened in Manchester. I'd appreciate it if you stuck around to watch those too. So, let's get started. When trying to classify assembly language, it's useful to look at the hierarchy of other languages. Now I've chosen some namings here which probably aren't conventional, but I think you'll see the gist of what I'm trying to get across. So for declarative structures, these are the really high level things. I, I consider that to be things like HTML, JSON, essentially languages which don't really have an executable order, but still nonetheless define useful things. These very high-level languages are usually used uh, to define things in scripting languages as well as other things. So a scripting language I would consider things like uh, Python and uh, JavaScript. And oddball ones like Lua. I like Lua. These languages uh, usually execute line by line. There are some fancy compiling techniques to make things run a bit quicker, but ultimately they are interpreted at, uh, as and when they are required. And therefore they run in something called a virtual machine, which is basically a software equivalent to a computer. Now these virtual machines will be written in a, a more sophisticated language, usually along the lines of something like C++, uh, debatably something like C Sharp. I'll await some of the hate in the comments there. And a whole load of... Uh, older languages. The, the, the list of those is endless. And at the very bottom we have assembly language, which is the language that the CPU speaks. The problem with trying to define a hierarchy of languages is some of them share bits and pieces with others. So for example some could argue that C sharp here is actually a scripting language because it's interpreted. It produces a bytecode which requires a virtual machine. Ultimately, it's not black and white, and the point I'm trying to get across is that at the very top, we usually have things that define stuff, like what a website looks like. And at the very bottom, we have the instructions that tell the computer hardware how to display on the screen what that website should look like. But this video is about assembly language, so we need to have a look at computer systems architecture. Fundamentally, a computer consists of a central processing unit and RAM random access memory, and between the two, the central processing unit will output an address, and it can read or write to a certain location in the memory. Let's start with a very simple one. RAM is effectively an array to the coders out there. There is usually uh, an index, and uh, there will be some sort of data. Now, the width of the data depends on the architecture. We commonly hear 32-bit. Perhaps could be 128-bit, could be 256-bit. It really does depend on the system. Uh, this video is not going to go for any particular architecture. We're just going to keep everything very, very high level. Whereas RAM is used to store data, the CPU is used to manipulate data. And it does this by using several internal units. So I'll have a look at what these are. The first thing is the CPU usually contains registers, which are basically its own internal RAM. And it'll only have a small number of these. So in my simplified example here, we have four registers, RA, RB, RC, and RD, and these will just store numeric values. As we'll see later, some CPUs have specific registers for specific functions. A CPU isn't very useful unless it has an arithmetic logic unit, otherwise known as an ALU. The ALU is responsible for performing, well, addition, subtraction, and logic ands and ors, and other sort of uh, computations. CPUs will also contain uh, a status flag register, which is a collection of bits which tells us about the state of the CPU and the arithmetic logic unit. 
The program counter is used to store the address of where we're up to in our program. So as the program is executed sequentially, the program counter increases. The program counter value can be set depending on the result of something in the status flags register. So we can use this to branch, and we'll see an example of that later on. And finally, you usually have a section of input and output, or communication. So this is how we get data into and out of the CPU. The purpose and sophistication of a CPU depends on what parts it's got inside it. So some CPUs will have more registers, and some CPUs will have bigger and more complex arithmetic logic units. These are known as extensions, and on desktop computer architectures, we're very reliant on extensions for the processors to do lots of the wonderful things we expect them to do these days. Now, for the purposes of today's video, we're going to assume we have one more module, and you can't go into a shop and buy this, uh, and it's going to be program memory. So I'm going to keep this separate from uh, random access memory. And the program memory is accessed when the CPU outputs its uh, program counter. And in return, receives the next instruction that it needs to execute. This configuration is not how it works on your desktop, and in fact that the random access memory is, is used to store the program as well. However, on some uh, embedded systems, the program memory is frequently kept separate from the working random access memory. I've decided to keep the two separate just for this video. Uh, it, it clears things up through the worked example later on. If you're familiar with basic programming, you'll be familiar with the function, and a function takes arguments. Well, an assembly language can be considered to be the same thing, but if we use the correct uh, parlance for assembly language, the function is n normally called an opcode, and each argument would be called an op-rand. To demonstrate how assembly language works, we're going to design a very simple processor with just a handful of instructions. Now, operands can be either registers, as we saw before, registers A, B, C, and D. Uh, they can be memory addresses, locations somewhere in memory, and they can be uh, constants, numeric values. Our simple processor is only going to have four instructions. So the first is going to be move, which moves, uh, it's going to take two operands, and it, these are going to be the destination and a source. And the point of the move command is it moves contents from the source location to the destination location. We're going to have some very simple mathematics. So we'll have add and subtract, so these are our opcodes, and the first operand is going to be the register which we're targeting with the addition, and the second operand is going to be a value, or a register. And the fourth instruction is going to be jump. And the first operand is going to be the condition on which we jump. And the second operand will be the location of where we're going to jump to. This will become a bit more clear when we start writing some code later on. Our CPU can only move stuff, add stuff, subtract stuff, and jump to a different location. So is it very useful? Well, probably not, but it is enough to do some more advanced uh, functions. So how can we multiply a couple of numbers together? For example, if we had 3 times 10. Well, we know that if we sit in a loop, we can simply add 10 to itself three times. So let's have a look at the program for this. Here's a little example program I've written using our new language to multiply two numbers together. But I'll need to explain some of the syntax to you first. Clearly here we have the opcode, and we have our two operands. So the first operand here is RA, which we saw in our CPU means register A. The second operand I've put in square brackets, and this means uh, we want the uh, source of the move to be from memory address number 3. Unlike this one here, 
where I've not used the square brackets, uh, what I'm implying by this, uh, this operand is that we want to move the value 0 into register C. So we can load in a constant value or we can read from memory. Looking back at our RAM, I'm going to assume that our memory has now been populated with some values uh, so we can execute our program. In this case, we want to multiply 10 by 3, so these are already stored somewhere in memory. Now we're going to do something very old-fashioned and execute this program by hand. So we know for the first thing here we're going to do is read from location 3, which has the value 10. So that puts into RA the value 10. On the next iteration, we want to read in from memory into register B which we know is going to be uh, 3 this time. For the next instruction, we're simply setting a counter to 0. This is going to store our result. The add instruction here will take RA and add it to what's already in RC. So in this case, we've got RC equals RC plus RA, which in this instance is, of course, the same as saying 0 plus 10. So RC, after this instruction, equals 10. Likewise, the subtraction instruction here, sub, uh, subtracts the value from the current register. So here we've got RB equals RB minus 1, but it's a value this time, we're not using another register. So that equals 3 minus 1 equals 2. Now with the jump instruction, we're going to see something interesting. Let's look at the arithmetic logic unit in a bit more detail. Simply put, it takes two values and an instruction and performs the operation. So in this case it could be uh, our registers or constants, the instruction is the add or the subtract, and it gives us a result, but it also updates the status register. The status register contains some interesting things based on the result of the calculation it's just performed. So if I do a little bit of pseudocode here, we could say if result is equal to zero, then set the zero bit. don't. In our simple processor, the status register only contains this one bit, whether the result of the previous computation was equal to zero or not. Other bits that are commonly found in status registers include uh, overflows, carry bits. Has the result of the computation gone out of bounds of the number of bits allowed to store the result? You can also include uh, errors in the status register, such as divide by zeros. Going back to our program, we can now try and understand the jump statement a bit more. In this case, the condition is looking for not zero. So if we remember the zero bit was set by the result of the calculation, we can see in this case it was two, so it is not zero. So the jump condition is true, and we tell it to jump back to address 13. So this is going to loop back round up here. RC is now RC equals 10 plus 10. And RB is now 2 take 1. But we can see this is still not a 0. So again, we jump back round. This iteration, we can see RC equals 20 plus 10, which equals 30. So we know we're getting close to our result now. And on the next line down, RB is now 1 take 1 which is equal to zero. And that's important because now on our jump instruction, the result was zero, but we're checking for not being zero. So in this case, we don't jump. So on the final instruction, we just carry on with the next one, which is finally a move instruction, which says whatever is in register C here, we're going to store in memory address five. So register C already contains our 30, which is the result. And we're going to store that in memory address five, somewhere in RAM. So when the write occurs, 30, the result is written to that address location. So we've done a successful multiply. And this program demonstrates what is typically assumed by most people that don't really know assembly language is that they think it is hard. And that's because we didn't have a multiply instruction to help us out, so we had to do it the long way around. If our little CPU did have a multiply instruction, we'd only need to call it the once, so we wouldn't need to set up a loop, we wouldn't need to manage the registers as much. Let's now consider a slightly more real-world example. So I'm using uh, the Visual Studio environment here to look at some x86 compiled assembly language. This isn't going to go into the very minutiae of the language or what's going on, but it will show you how you can actually use the environment to study assembly language. First thing we want to do is run it in debug mode. 
So I, I like to highlight a line and press Ctrl and F10. And what I've set up here in the debug window is if I get it to show, first of all, the disassembly, uh, it goes a bit small and I can't zoom in, unfortunately, in Visual Studio, so you'll have to bear with me on that. And in the registers, I've got the, well, I've got the register window viewing at the bottom here. So we can see that in the x86, in its most simple level, we have some registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. These are like our RA, RB, RC and RD that we had before. And we've also got some flags. Well, let's have a look at the code that it produced. So we can see from my line of C code here, the int a equals 10, we stored the value 10 in the address pointed to by a using a move command, just as we did before. So uh, it's obviously in hexadecimal here. The same goes for b. We're storing the value 3 at the location pointed to by uh, the variable b. And let's have a look at how it handles the instructions. So the first thing it's doing is loading from the memory uh, where variable A is stored, it's loading it into EAX. And we can see here, down here in the register window, that EAX has now been set to 10, in hex of course, which is A. The x86 does have a multiply instruction, and we can see it uses the EAX register, which is preloaded with the value 10, and it's using directly from memory the value stored wherever the variable B is. So the, the disassembly window here doesn't show you all of the memory addresses of these things, because it would be inhumane, uh, for, quite frankly, to debug these things. So uh, it does actually use the symbol that I provided in the code, which is very handy. And so it'll do the result, and the result is gone straight into uh, EAX, and so 1E is in fact the hexadecimal 430. And we store now, just as we did before with the move instruction again, we store back into wherever location C is in the memory, we store the value of register EAX, which is the result of the equation. So this program does exactly the same as the little toy program we created earlier. Let's have a look at some uh, differences between the CPU architecture. So if I choose to operate in the floating point domain now instead of the integer, how does it resolve this? Let's take a look. And when we look at this, we start to see why assembly language has a bit of a reputation for being tough. What is going on here? Well, let's just have a look at the commands that are being used first. So the first thing we can see, there is a move command. It is a slightly different move command to before, but it's still the same thing. The principle is the same. And we can see, actually, there is a multiply command down here. But everything else looks a lot more complicated. Why is this? The x86 processor has some extensions specifically for dealing with floating point, and the compiler has recognized that our code could benefit and be faster from using these instead. In fact, the extension it's used here is the SSE extension, so we can see that the register XMM0 is on here. So this is an extra set of registers just on the CPU specifically for handling floating point data. Let's step through and see what happens. This time I've expanded the registers window to the side, makes things a bit clearer, and we can see up here in the, uh, the these are the, the raw register values, but the debugger also provides the floating point equivalent, so that will make things a bit easier for us to follow what's going on. So the first instruction was load A with 10, and because we need to use a specific register, the first thing we have to do is load our data into the, uh, into the processor. So we've loaded in now our value 10 here, which uh, of course is all in now exponential notation, we can load in our value 3. So in this case, we're loading into uh, floating point register XMM0, and then we're storing the contents of that register back into memory. So here we've got the, the actual the guts of the calculation. The first thing it's done is load the memory now pointed to by A into XMM0, which is our 10. We can see here in exponential notation that it's done it. And then it multiplies directly the register with itself and the value from B. So this is three operands going on here, not just two. And straight away we've now got the result 30. And then it stores that result back out in memory. Even though this looks horrific, uh, we can disable some of these uh, compiler settings so we can use simpler and other extensions of the CPU. Let's have a look. So if I go into the project properties for this uh, program, and go to the code generation, I can specify uh, which sets of extensions are used for um, floating point calculations. So I'm going to disable them entirely. I'm going to say you can't use any of the more advanced features. Let's see how it compiles the code this time. The first thing that we can see is it doesn't use all of these complicated registers, so I'm going to get rid of these from the view. In fact, what it does use is the really old school Intel x86 floating point registers. And this uses a slightly different operand and opcode architecture. So the first instruction was a floating point load, FLD. 
where it loaded in the numeric value. It then goes and stores that value in memory again, which see, see exactly the same notation used for memory. Then we're going to do exactly the same for uh, 3. So we've done our 10, we've done our 3, and now we'll have a look at the calculation. It works a little bit like a stack in this case, that it now is going to read from the memory address pointed to by variable A with the FLD, floating point load. And we can see here that the register on this uh, uh, this ST0, I'm not quite sure what the ST stands for, but it makes sense to think of it in a stack in this sense. So we've loaded in uh, the value 10 in exponential notation, and now we're going to multiply it directly by the value stored in memory 3, which gives us our result 30. And then we store that back out in C. We've now looked at two different ways of compiling the same program, just using different compiler flags. So we're choosing which bits of the CPU we want to perform our computations. What's reassuring is that yes, even though the, the notation has changed slightly, there's still a common thread, there's still some familiarity between each of the extensions. So we can, we can work out what's going on and we can follow how the code is being executed. My system level architecture diagram here is a little oversimplified. Um, for example, if the processor can only talk to the memory, how does it do anything useful? It's just doing calculations and storing it back in memory. Well, on quite a lot of architectures, one thing to do is to have memory addresses which have specific functionality. Let's consider a piece of hardware that's monitoring a temperature sensor, for example. The temperature sensor is filling an area of this memory and our central processing unit is using its bus to read from it. Likewise, let's say we wanted to set the brightness of an LED. Uh, one way to do it is the CPU will write to a known memory location the value that it wants and some, some extra hardware will go away and deal with the brightness. Knowing that you've got certain parts of your memory allocated to doing hardware stuff does make using memory quite tedious and tricky. Um, in Windows and other operating systems we're kind of used to just letting the operating system handle that for us. We just give us some memory and it goes thank you very much, here you are. Uh, but on an embedded platform it's very important that you know what these locations are. And we do occasionally still see this in Windows. For example, as you install more hardware, you will see the amount of overall RAM decreasing. For example, you put a big graphics card in with a gig of RAM, it's not uncommon to see your system RAM decrease by a gig because it's mapped that address space over to the graphics card. I will emphasize that what we've seen today is a very simplified view of assembly language, although it should give you a taste of how useful it can be. You might think, why would I ever need to program like this? Well, on new systems, systems that haven't got any software written for them already. If you want to build drivers, for example, for hardware, somebody still has to do this level of coding. The compiler simply doesn't exist. There used to be an argument that you could write much quicker and more optimized code uh, using assembly language, although this is debatable now, the power of today's compilers is, is, is quite surprising and often will create more optimized code than the programmer thought that they could do in the first place. Even though there are professional programmers out there that will never need to see assembly language, it's good to have an appreciation of just how much work the processor is doing to do what they consider to be a simple thing. And having an appreciation about just how many clock cycles are required to execute your pretty logo on the screen can only be a good thing. I quite like assembly language, and I think I'm going to do more videos on this topic. Uh, in particular, I'd like to create a virtual machine that executes our very simplified uh, assembly language I used as an example. And potentially we could take that even further, we could implement it in VHDL and run it on an FPGA, so it's no longer a software machine, it's a genuine physical processor running our own language. I don't know, we'll see where it goes. One thing I'm sure of when we start talking about assembly language is some people can get very excited about it. So if, you, if I've said something that upsets you or if you agree with something, please say so in the comments. If you found this video useful, give me a thumbs up. Have a subscribe. I'll see you next time. Thanks for continuing to watch. This isn't code related and I'm not going to get into the habit of airing my personal views. But the recent events in Manchester have hit a little too close to home for me to ignore. Until recently, I lived and worked in Manchester city centre for 12 years, and still have many close connections to the city. Clearly, the cowardly act of terrorism was abhorrent, and has rightfully been condemned by the international community. The thing with Manchester, though, is perhaps its citizens are the embodiment of cultural acceptance. Just days after the attack, Manchester hosted the Manchester Marathon, where crowds of hundreds of thousands of different races, colours, creeds, sexual orientations, religious persuasions, got together to celebrate charity. I can't think of a better way to say, up yours, to those who want us to live our lives according to their bizarre, myopic and hate-fueled doctrines.
Well done, Manchester.